Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming here this morning. My name is Rodrigo Valdivia. I serve as chancellor here in the diocese, and it's my privilege to welcome you to the conference this morning. We'd like to begin with a brief prayer, and so I've invited Sister Carlotta De Lorenzo, Director of the Office for Permanent Diaconate, to lead us in a brief prayer. Let us begin with a moment of silence and gratitude. And so we begin, in the presence of God and one another, to welcome into our presence and prayer the sixth bishop of the Diocese of San Diego. Today, we ask for him every blessing of the wisdom of the Spirit, the humanity of the Son, and the loving care of the Father. Today we ask for the Diocese of San Diego, a full communion of love of God and love of neighbor, creating within our diocese the hope and peace for which this world longs. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister. Now I will ask Monsignor Steve Callahan, who has served as the diocesan administrator for the past six months, to come up. Good morning. Good morning. I'm happy to announce that at noon today in Rome, Pope Francis appointed Bishop Robert W. McElroy to be the sixth bishop of San Diego. Bishop McElroy was born in San Francisco in 1954. As a fifth generation San Franciscan, Bishop McElroy lived until he was 10 years old in Daly City. And then his family moved to Burlingame. Feeling called to the priesthood, he entered St. Joseph Seminary in Mountain View to begin his high school years. For college, he decided to pursue his studies outside of the seminary system, so he went to Harvard University in 1972, and three years later earned his bachelor's degree in history. Then he went to Stanford University, where in 1996 he earned a master's degree in history. He then re-entered the seminary in the fall of 1976 at St. Patrick's Seminary in Menlo Park. He was ordained a priest to the Archdiocese of San Francisco in 1980. After a few years in a parish and then diocesan assignment, he undertook graduate studies in the field of Catholic social teaching obtaining a licentiate in theology from the Jesuit School of Theology at Berkeley, then a doctorate in moral theology from the Gregorian University in Rome, and then a doctorate in political science from Stanford. He returned to parish ministry in 1989 in San Francisco, and then he was appointed Vicar General of the Archdiocese in 1995 and pastor of a parish in San Mateo in 1996, where he served for 15 years. Bishop McElroy was ordained an auxiliary bishop of the Archdiocese of San Francisco on September 7, 2010, and he served as the Archdiocesan Vicar for parish life and development until his appointment to San Diego. Bishop McElroy will be formally installed as the sixth bishop of San Diego at a mass to be celebrated on Wednesday, April 15th at one o'clock p.m. at St. Therese of Carmel Parish. I join Bishop Brahm, Bishop Chavez, priests, deacons, and lay faithful in welcoming Bishop 
McRoy to Episcopal Ministry in San Diego. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be a San Diegan. <laughs> and I never thought I'd say this, but it's great to be a Southern Californian. <laughs> That's hard for a San Franciscan, but it's a joy to be here in this beautiful place. I want to thank you for the beautiful prayer with which we began today, raising our spirits to God. And I also want to thank Monsignor Callahan for the role that he has exercised as administrator of this diocese in the very difficult time after Bishop Cirillo's death, which was a great sadness. And I know Bishop Cirillo is with us in prayer this day on behalf of this diocese and my new ministry. And in particular, I also want to thank Bishop Brom for all of the work and the labor and the sacrifice and the ministry which he undertook as the Bishop of San Diego and laid such a wonderful foundation for all that is and all that will be to come and I hope to build upon in collaboration with the leadership, of the priests and the people of this great diocese in the years to come. Quiero hablar por un momento con la comunidad hispana de nuestra diócesis de San Diego, porque en un sentido muy profundo, los hispanos son la fundación y el centro de esta diócesis. Históricamente, en el presente y por el futuro. Históricamente, español fue el idioma en que el Evangelio de Jesucristo fue predicado por primera vez en esta región de Alta California. Ahora, los hispanos son la mayoría de los católicos en nuestra diócesis. Y por el futuro. La fe y la vitalidad y la dedicación a familia de la comunidad hispana son absolutamente esenciales por el éxito de la iglesia en este nuevo milenio. Por esta razón, como el nuevo obispo de San Diego, Quiero ser siempre un buen pastor, su buen pastor, y un amigo en Jesucristo, que es nuestro hermano, nuestro Señor y nuestro Salvador. In coming to San Diego, it brings to my mind and my heart Many joys I experienced growing up because my family used to come here for vacation. And I remember encountering then and encounter in a very much deeper way today all of the graces that lie around us in this beautiful place, which are assigned to us as a local church and as a region, as a society of the presence of God and of the call to God in our midst. In the beauty of this place itself, in the ocean, in the vistas, we see the created God given to us, creation the Lord has given to us, bestowed upon us all as a graced place this region is with such a beautiful climate. The beauty of God, the gift of God, lies all around us every day here. And that is a source of constant joy and thanksgiving for this local church. The mission is a symbol of the history of this diocese and of the whole region, historically for the region as a whole, and as a place of faith, as a community of faith coming together. It is the sign, particularly in the year in which Father Sarah will be canonized, it is the sign of the sacrifices that men and women made to preach the gospel and to build a church here and to build a society here rooted in the faith of Jesus Christ. The mission is also a sign to us of the need to support the Native American communities 
in our midst, in this diocese, and in our country as a whole, and as a reminder to us of the tendency that can come even within the life of the church to let marginalization occur in a way that is harmful to many. We live here on the border, which is the link that brings all of the Americas together. We are the new world, all of us together, North America, South America. And the border is a reminder to us of who we are as a nation. We are a people of immigrants and have always been. Immigration is the vitality of our nation. It's the source of its strength and its diversity and all of the richness and beauty that make us a people, a fabric as Americans. You know, there was a great historical debate in the United States. What makes America different? And the answer to that debate fundamentally, many years ago, was that we are a people bound together not by blood. We are a people bound together in the many different places that we have come from by a set of ideas, which is freedom and justice and liberty for all. The border is a reminder to us of what we are called to be in our greatness as Americans, and that we sometimes fall short of in how we deal with immigrants and how we must really confront the issues of immigration and resolve them with justice and have comprehensive immigration reform that will do that. And the border is also to us a continuing sign of vitality, of our union with all the peoples of the Americas, and a great sense that God is giving to us that all of us are called to be brothers and sisters. We have the beauty of the bay, the bay which led originally the Europeans to come to this place and to claim it, but the bay which beckons us all now to the global society that has emerged in the age in which we live, to the peoples of the Pacific and to the immigrants who come from the Pacific and form such a rich part of our diocese here in San Diego. And also, the bay is a sign to us of the historic placement here of so many American military men and women who have served our nation in order to make the cause of freedom possible and realized in the world in which we live, in a continuing commitment they have that we honor in faith and respect for them this day. We are called to be part of a global people now. And we are called to understand that as people of faith, as people of justice, as children of the one God, we are called to see ourselves in solidarity with all of the peoples of the world. Yes, to have commerce together that enriches all, but more than that, to build understanding, to build an international order which truly speaks of justice and freedom linked together. I look at the universities which exist in our midst, and they are a great sign of hope for the future. They're where our young people go to, to learn and to live and to grow and to mature and to question and to probe and to come to a fuller understanding of all of the world that God has created for all of us as gift and calls us to use as gift as brothers and sisters. The universities of this diocese are a source of technological innovation and of new knowledge, but more importantly, they are a source of human minds and hearts and souls reflecting upon what the world is and even more importantly, in God's grace, what our world can be. And finally, I look at the Imperial Valley in that great, rich, place of agriculture, which teaches us of our historic role in California to feed the world, and to feed the world in a sustainable way which honors the environment and the creation God has given to us. All around us, we see these blessings of God. All around us, we see the call of God to be more and more a people of faith who put the gospel into practice who teach the next generation. This year is the 50th anniversary of the conclusion of the Second Vatican Council. 
And at that council, the fathers of the church said that we have very beautiful images of the church we are called to be. One of the most beautiful was this. The church is called to be a sacrament, that is, a sign of God's grace. That all of us, in our strengths and in our weaknesses in the life of the church, are called to reflect the presence of God. And Catholic theology believes that each of us has one call and one call only in the world, to do the best that we can in our lives, to imitate the person of Jesus Christ, and to live out the virtues of the Lord himself, of kindness and compassion and mercy and sacrifice and integrity of prayerfulness and faith and hope and love. And in doing so, in living out those virtues, to ennoble the world in which we live. This is the call of the church to be sacrament in the world, to be sacrament in this region of San Diego County and Imperial County. This is the call of the church to be the people of God, pilgrims together, walking, not understanding exactly where God is leading us, but understanding that as long as God leads and we follow the pathway that God has sketched out for us, we will grow in grace and grow in unity and can grow in making this wonderful world of creation, this wonderful region in which we live, a graced place even more fully than it is now. And so it is with great joy that I come to this place so filled with richness and blessings, so filled with a history of sacrifices in the life of the church which have built up this ecclesial community and built up this society of this region in which we live. I give thanks to God. I give thanks to the Holy Father for this appointment for which I am most grateful. I give thanks to my parents and to my family who raised me and gave me the gift of grace and so much more. I give thanks to all who came before me, and I will, to the best of my abilities, try to live on in that spirit and to be a servant to you, to be someone who listens, someone who comes to understand and to love ever more fully this beautiful diocese and ever more fully this rich, diverse, wonderful, vital community of faith. Thank you. Okay. Peter McElroy, what, what do you see as the, uh, the primary goals you have coming into, uh, into this office? What are the, the immediate priorities? Um, I would say the first one is to know what I don't know. <laughs> that is, um, when I was uh, in the seminary and they taught us uh, what a pastor should do on coming into a parish, the first rule they taught us was do nothing for a year. Learn about your parish and your people and come to love them and understand them as best you can and then act. And so the, the first priority I would have is to come to know and understand the people of this great diocese and its history, its culture, its traditions, and how it functions as a community of faith. What are strengths and weaknesses? What are the hopes and aspirations of the people here? And secondly, in learning about them, come to love them. Uh, because that's my, my first goal as a pastor, is to come to know and understand and love the people whom I call to serve. And only then am I going to have any priorities at all. I would say in a wider context, it is this. To help people understand the call of God as it comes to them. Pope Francis has been enormously helpful in this regard. Uh, he gave a talk about two weeks ago to the cardinals when he was creating the new cardinals. And he said, there is within the church a tension, a tendency on the one hand to be exclusive, to focus on the truth in a way that can exclude. And on the other hand, to be inclusive, to be reinstating, as he put. And he said, 
It's really important that the church be one of inclusion and reinstatement, that that is our first stance, because that was the stance of Christ. When we look at Jesus in the gospel and say, how did Jesus approach those who were hurting and those who came to him? He did not do it first and foremost, enunciating teaching, moral teaching specifically. Rather, he came to those who were in need. He embraced them with the love of God. He healed them in their hurt. And then he spoke with them about the challenge of reforming their lives. It is in this order that the church, I think, is called to reach out. And uh, that the Pope said in this speech, uh, there's a tension between caring about losing the saved and the call to save, saving the lost. And he said, saving the lost must be the first priority because in a very real way, all of us in our lives on this earth at times are lost. One of the most beautiful passages in the gospel is uh, Jesus' parable of when he speaks of the good shepherd. And he said, the good shepherd would go out and leave the 99 sheep behind in the herd to go after the one that is lost. Now I have to say, this is one of those parables I considered um, not believable. So many years ago when I was in parish work, I got called to give the last rites to a, a man who'd been a professional shepherd. He was living in Redwood City at the time in my parish, but he had been in the Basque country of Nevada for most of his life, and he was a professional shepherd. So I said to him, is it likely at all a, a, a sensible shepherd would do that, leave behind the whole flock to go after the one? And he said, a good shepherd might. And he said, the reason a good shepherd might do that is because when he brings back the one sheep, having found that sheep on his shoulders, and the whole of the flock sees this, the flock understands, he loves me personally and individually and cares for me personally and individually in that very same way. And that is, I believe, what uh, Pope Francis is trying to orient us toward. It is that kind of love in the life of the church which was, must resonate outward and understand that all of us stand in need of the mercy of God and that that is the richest blessing we have in our lives. Not that God comes to us when we do everything right, but that God stands with us precisely when we fail and stands with us and helps us to get up and goes on and embraces us in love. I just wanted to see if, uh, well, I know you'll be spending the year, but will you be also hoping to maybe introduce some of the ideas from the Diocese of Francisco, such as the morality manual for teachers, some of the things that are Well, one of the things of coming to learn will be to come to learn how the um, schools in the Diocese of San Diego teach the Catholic faith and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And thus, I'll be attentive to wanting to know how that occurs. But I have every confidence that when I do look into that and visit the schools, I will find that they are teaching the gospel of Christ very effectively. So I have every confidence that that will be the case. And I'm looking forward to that and, and to meeting the school communities because that's such an important uh, nexus for the, the preaching of the gospel in the years to come. But I have every expectation that they are carrying out that task uh, at the present moment fully and effectively and would uh, find no reason to believe I had to impose anything, so. I don't know anything about the particular situation, but I certainly would hope to be an advocate for the homeless in, in this diocese and in this region. Um, we, when I was a pastor, we started a program which we'd imported from back east 
um, and uh, it was for homeless families. And they would stay in various churches, uh, and they'd move from place to place in the churches. Stay in each church would uh, put up a group of families and, and provide meals and provide care and so forth. And of course, shelter, which was most important. And then we connected them to some uh, programs to assist in them finding jobs and finding some uh, service support along the way. And uh, when I began this in the parish where I was a pastor, um, the neighboring parish had had a difficulty. And in fact, when they tried to bring this parish in, the city council passed a law to make it illegal to do so. So I, um, knowing this, I, uh, in preaching on it in the, at the homilies on the Sunday when we introduced the program, I said, I, I, I preached from the gospel of Jesus, uh, the birth of Christ, who was himself homeless. And uh, I needed some volunteers for this, and we had 491 volunteers for the program because people understand when they reflect in the light of faith, the home, Christ himself was homeless. He came into the world homeless. The Blessed Mother and St. Joseph were homeless. And that's the prism I think we have to look on this, this issue with us, which is a complicated issue and has many dimensions to it and is not easily addressable in some circumstances. But it is something we have to wrestle with and at least say in our consciences, we have done our best to help every single person that we can. Yes. Bishop, how do you believe your, your political science education is going to help you navigate through the secular world? Well, uh, one of the dilemmas that we have in, in, in uh, the Catholic Church is that uh, our social teaching crosses the whole spectrum of the per current partisan political divide. That is, uh, in the crucial areas of Catholic teaching, there are certain areas in which it tends to be the Republican candidates are more supportive of the agenda of, of the church and the teaching of the church. For example, on abortion, euthanasia, religious liberty. And then there's a whole other spectrum of Catholic social teaching, which is equally important, on which the Democratic Party is more likely to be supportive. There are questions of, of immigration, questions of poverty, questions of the environment. So for us, on one hand, it's difficult in that no political party and very few public officials who have partisan identities uh, agree with the broad social teaching of the church or seek to implement them. On the other hand, for us as people of the church, it's freeing in a sense because it avoids the temptation for us to ever be drawn into any alliance with any political partisan structure here in the United States because there is none which represents most fully Catholic social teaching. So it's a dilemma, but we're just called to teach what we teach, but with a sense that then it falls as we try to inform the consciences of men and women as, as citizens and believers, it falls to them the very difficult choice. How do they vote in a way that best reflects this broad spectrum of Catholic teaching? So I'm Peter Rowe with UC yes. San Diego. In your comments, you mentioned the need for comprehensive immigration reform. Yes. Oh, what can you do as bishop to bring that about, and how do you see your role in that, in that debate? Um, in the Archdiocese of San Francisco, I've worked with the public policy arm. That's one of the areas that I supervise now, um, and particularly within the Hispanic community. But the real challenge of immigration reform lies not within the Hispanic community, but within the wider community. And what I have found most effective is that when those outside the Hispanic or the Filipino community, which also there are many undocumented, uh, when the stories of the undocumented are brought firsthand in person to our wider community, people understand with a new openness of heart the issues that lie before us as a nation and the pathway we should take. And so uh, I think that's the most effective way to do it when, when people broadly understand the issues of humanity that are at stake, that so many working people who have been here many years, 
trying to raise their family, make sacrifices, doing everything right, and yet must live in the shadows. And what that means, that when you're driving down the street, you're always fearful. That when you go to the work, you don't know that you'll come home or that your mother or father will come home. These are tragedies. And that's why comprehensive immigration reform is absolutely necessary in, in our society. And it's crucial that we attain it. Yes. Um, this has been the great tragedy of the church in the last 50 years. Has been. Uh, I don't want to say confront the abuse crisis. It's that the, the abuse crisis existed in the first place. That the abuse existed. And we have wrestled with that and are trying to still wrestle with it. And I'd say there are certain lessons we have to keep in mind on this. One of them is that we need to constantly reform our environments so that they maximize safety and security for children from abuse, for, for young people. We have to do everything we can. And that means not just within our own environments of schools and parishes and so forth, but also in the larger environments of family life and so forth. We need to take, a, take as much action as we can in terms of education, in terms of structural reforms to advance that purpose. Secondly, we can never relax on that question. We can never think we have done enough or that we have put it in the past. It is a grave wound in the life of the church. And the church has taken tremendous steps to change its whole way of doing things. And that's wonderful. But we cannot relax in those efforts. We cannot say we've reformed enough. Uh, as to transparency, one of the crucial steps that the church took uh, in the United States that was uh, so crucial, I think, was this. Uh, during most of the period, lead before the charter in 2002, uh, in most dioceses, when uh, allegations of sexual abuse came up, the facts were decided by priests or bishops, okay? And uh, I watched that unfold uh, in San Francisco and knew it was a terrible system, partly because of the clerical culture, partly because the priests and bishops doing it weren't trained to do that. So that in San Francisco, actually, before uh, the charter came out, two years before that, we instituted uh, uh, an independent lay advisory board to do the fact-finding and recommending the uh, decisions that should be made as a consequence of, of their fact-finding, precisely because we knew you needed people skilled in these fields to do the investigation, and you needed skilled, people skilled in the various fields of counseling, of law enforcement, of, of police work uh, and, and to evaluate uh, what needed to be done. And so I think that that probably is the most important reform alongside the notion that uh, any, uh, anyone who is involved in the uh, abuse of a minor uh, simply, even in one case, cannot be allowed to be in ministry uh, and, and or you know in the, in the, in the employee of the archdiocese or the diocese in terms of employment. Uh, so I think those are the key reforms. But I'd say a constant notion of vigilance going forward needs to be in place, and that's 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 hard to sustain at times. But we need to sustain it. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That concludes the conference. Thank you all for coming. If there are any, any individual reporters that want to have a, a individual questions, we'll be going to this side of the room. Thank you.